Um, classism is uh, the differential treatment based on social class. Um, and Shane, that's what Shane Lloyd's presentation is going to be based on. Um, there's a handout that he's going to be going through with you. Um, Shane Lloyd received his uh, Bachelor's of Science degree in Behavioral Neuroscience from Northeastern. Um, then he completed his Master's in Public Health from the Albert Medical School at Brown University. And, that, and cur Shane's current position is Assistant Director for the uh, Third World Center at Brown University. Um, so he is, should be here very shortly, but what he asked me to do while we're waiting is to turn to the person to the right of you and think about the very first person you can remember you thought of that you remember meeting of someone that would had a higher in, much higher income bracket than you and you and think about that for a couple of minutes and then he's going to pick up right from there be right back yeah. all right thank you everyone uh, again uh, here is Shane Lloyd from the Brown University's third world center hi everyone oh does the mic work the mic is for the recording. Oh, so I just have to stand here. Oh, perfect. Okay. Well, so sorry for my tardiness. So, well, first I'll say welcome. Welcome to this conversation around class and classism. Um, as Robert Zendis mentioned, my name is Shane Lloyd and I work at Brown University. And at Brown University, we tend to start things late. But <clears throat> so please excuse us. Um, the other thing I will say is this is a wonderful introduction to a conversation about class and classism because what does it mean? to live in a location where you have access to, I, I thought I could just go on Uber and pay for someone to bring me here. <laughs> that was stupid. <laughs> so clearly, um, although I have the resources, resources are only but so good if you actually are in a location to exercise them. So it's a really lovely introduction. So um, what we're gonna do today is have a wonderful time to talk a little bit about our own class backgrounds, and I'll do a little bit of sharing about my own class background, and then we'll also talk about structural classism and how that happens in the world, and have opportunity for you all to build community based on class identities and backgrounds. Now, the reason I really like doing this work, because I'm an associate trainer for class action, but also an assistant director, so formerly the Third World Center as of last week at 1.30 p.m., and now it's the Brown Center for Students of Color. So the name changed <laughs> lightning fast. But the reason I enjoy having these conversations around race and other domains of social identity is because identity is what undergirds a lot of the very sticky issues that the United States and many nations across the world are facing. And there is a lot of vocabulary dating back to the 60s and 70s around gender, sexuality, and race in particular, but class tends to be the murkiest of concepts. So for example, I grew up in an upper middle class, or I was born rather, in an upper middle class suburb in Westchester, New York called Valhalla, like Valhalla of the Norse gods. Sounds pretty epic, right? Really not that important. But <clears throat> I was also, we, my parents were in Queens for a short time, and then we moved to a middle class suburb in Valley Stream. Any Valley Streamers here? Yes. Yay! <laughs> One Valley Streamer. I grew up in Franklin Square, but I went to Valley Stream North High School. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> Great, I very rarely meet Valley streamers ever, so you are now my best friend. Um, <clears throat> and you know, one of the things that we used to do when I was a high school student was guess which car my mother was gonna pick me up in. Because every week my mother would have a new car, and oftentimes a lot of my friends that I grew up with, they went on fancy vacations, I went on fancy vacations. By the time I was 25, I nearly died in just about every continent except for Antarctica, only because I never got there yet. So. <clears throat> The fact that I'm actually standing before you all is really, really quite a miracle because I should have been dead at least six times, two if you count anything in South Africa. Um, <clears throat> but very few people would realize that if they were to dig deep within my story, they would find that even though I have these owning class indicators of, you know, I have an elite degree from Brown University, I have a private degree from Northeastern University, and I've traveled all over the world, and I'm not really good with languages, but I can say parlez-vous français, and you know, that's nice. Um, but little do people realize that my father was actually a cabin cleaner in the airlines and he worked for United Airlines and then the rental car company and part of his union benefits was getting us access to free travel and first or business class. And then my mother was a car saleswoman who has boatloads of cars but car salespeople. So it made sense that she would have she would pick us up in a different car every single week. So you begin to see that, you know, as we talk about particular indicators and dig a little bit deeper, it gets a little bit more complicated to peg where people are. Because, you know, other people would say, oh, wow, you travel, you must be rich. And then others like, oh, wow, your father is an, a cleaning agent. What does that mean? Because his position and status doesn't 
you know, have the same regard as a CEO. So that's some of what we're gonna talk about this afternoon. So I know Rob introduced for you all, what was your first memory of someone from a higher class background? Now I'm gonna, did you thank your partners when you did that? Oh, thank them, thank them, they shared information. Be grateful. So now, <laughs> now I'm gonna ask you to find a new partner, however best you can. And this time I want you to think about what is your first memory of someone from a lower class background and how did you know that we're, they're from a lower class background? So I'm gonna give you two minutes to think about that. Okay, and time. Oops. So I'm gonna ask you to thank your partner however you're comfortable. Okay, so you had three different experiences. I talked a little bit about my class background and didn't explain anything why I only rely on cabs, but that's not important. Um, <laughs> we, you talked a little bit about how did you know someone was from a higher class background. You talked a little bit with a partner about what it is that suggested someone was from a lower class background than you are. So if we could get two people to either share some reflections or share what are some of the indicators that came up that suggested someone was from a higher class or lower class background. And what I'll do is describe it up here um, <clears throat> on this computer. And if anyone paid attention to the bio and noticed Brown University, Brown University does not mean spelling. <laughs> not just bringing some words together. So, indicators, throw them at me.
at different things. Mm -hmm. Like I know people that are a lot better off than me in my family, and they react to certain things very differently than how I and people I know who uh, are less fortunate uh, do react. Mm -hmm. So I just see kind of like a difference mainly because of just how we've grown up differently with different factors and just how, um, I should say, uh, how well we've grown can sometimes be class-based. When I was, the first time I flew economy when it wasn't a punishment by my father because of misbehavior <laughs> was when I was traveling to Australia and the first thing that came out of my sister's mouth was forget about traveling with the class, just tell daddy to buy you a ticket in first class. And I said, but I'm all about the team. That was the dumbest decision ever. <laughs> it's very uncomfortable, but you know, integrity, also important. <laughs>
parental education, so thinking of your highest educated parent, and then the third category, so income, education, and then home ownership. What kind of home did you live in? So is everyone kind of ready? Stretch those legs up. What kind of home you were brought up in, or what yeah. kind of, oh, okay. Broadly. Because what I'm going to ask you to do, and this might be hard for some folks, is think back to the age of 12. Now, I know for some people that was a nightmarish period of your life, and you never want to go back there. So please, for the sake of the exercise, I ask you to go back in time with me. And the reason we choose the age of 12 to do this exercise is because that's when people are, tend to come into consciousness about their own social identities. So are those three concepts are in each group? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what I'm going to ask you to do is, as best as possible, kind of work your way to different parts of the room. So hold on. So the first one. Okay. So, <clears throat> everyone ready? I don't think we understand exactly. <laughs> oh, sure. I will show you. So what's going to happen is we're going to get a sense of who's in the room by doing a sorting activity called four corners. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to break down particular spectrum. So we talked about income parental education and home ownership, and we're gonna break those down into four different corners, and people are gonna go based on what their experience was like at the age of 12. Got it? And what I'm gonna do is after each time, I'm gonna tell you to take note of any patterns that you might see in the room. So you're gonna take note of you know, race, gender, ethnicity, like take notes, well take noticing of that, and then what I'll also do is provide you with some statistics so you have a sense of how this room compares to the nation overall. Make sense? Yes. Excellent. So we will start with, well, this is easy. We'll start with parental education. So this software for folks. Yeah. <laughs> That's all right. OK, so with parental education, so if you had parents with a high school degree or high school or vocational training, I'm going to ask you to stand right around here, OK? Huh? Highest level. Highest, just highest, 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 highest parent with the highest education is high school degree. Yeah. So if you had parents without a high school degree, I would ask that you stand over in this corner. Now, if you had parents, oh wait, don't sort out just yet. So if you had parents, <laughs> so if you had parents who went to a private school and or elite college and universities, so like the Ivy League and whatnot, you would stand over in this corner. And then for folks over here, if your parents went to college, but not necessarily a big name university like Brown or any of the other Ivy League institutions, you would stand right here. So everyone got a sense of their location? From relatively, as best as you can, relatively clear corners. Sorry for the camera person. <laughs> okay. So now I want you to just take a look around the room, just take a, a visual scan and get a sense for if you see any patterns about where people are standing. So remember, we have college educated, elite education, without high school, and then high school and vocational. So everyone has a sense of where people are. Now, to provide you with some statistics, about 26 to 28% of American citizens have a bachelor's degree. So not even talking about whether, where that degree came from, but just having a degree. So as you can tell, it's about half and half with this room, which speaks to the fact that this, this room, in particular compared to the rest of the United States, has a relatively higher educated group of folks, with, or higher educated parental folks. Everyone got that? OK, so take a breather. And then I'm going to ask you to get back to the center of the room as best as you can. <laughs> and then we're going to talk a little bit about, oh, I remember. <clears throat> now we're going to talk about housing, OK? So if, remember, and we're thinking about this at the age of 12. So if at the age of 12, you lived in stable rented housing or had modest home ownership, 
you would stand right around here. If at the age of 12, you lived in substandard housing or public housing or had frequent moves due to money problems or homelessness, you would stand over here. Excuse me. <clears throat> now, if you owned a luxury home or had more than one house, you would stand over here. And then over in this corner, if you had a comfortable house with the ability to tr trade up to a bigger house, but you, didn't you could have, but you didn't necessarily, you would stand over here. So everyone got a sense of the locations? Okay. So try to make some relatively distinct corners as best as you can. So now if we were to, so once again, take note of any trends that you might see. And if we were to throw in some statistics, about a third of households in the United States are renter, renters. So that means, by and large, most people, most people own their homes. So take that statistic in mind and compare it to the room. Great. So now I'm going to ask you to get back to the center. And now we'll go to <laughs> Now we're going to do one last indicator. OK, so now we're going to do one last indicator, everyone. And this time, remember, so keeping it in mind, back to the age of 12 years old, now we're going to talk about where does your family derive their income from. So everyone heard? So where does your family derive income from? So I'll start with this corner over yonder. If your family derived their income primarily from investments such that your family did not have to work to make ends meet, You would stand right here. Oh, you mean um, the family inheritance you're talking? Oh, yeah, just okay. so any, if you are, we're talking about, you know, Blue Ivy money, Hilton money, like they don't, she could just exist for the rest of her life and be perfectly fine. <clears throat> so now if over here, if your family was, if your family made their income from professional wages or salaries, you would stand right over here. In this corner, if your family derived income from hourly wages or working in or owning a very, very small business, over here. And then lastly, if your members of your, your parents lack steady work or income or derived income from public assistance or a charity, you would stand over in this corner. So, <clears throat> so try your best to get into a clump of sorts. Okay, great. Oh, so we have some investment folks. Kind of straddling the line between. Okay, great. And then, um, so, to, so once again, take note of any patterns that you might see and where people are standing or where they're positioned in the room. 
And then to provide you all with a statistic, about a third of the US population is comprised of professionals or managers. So people who tend to have at least a bachelor's and work in a position where they're either supervising or delegating tasks to other people. So think about that um, and think about where people are sort of situated within this room and hold on to that. Now what I'm gonna ask you to do is go to the corner where you stood most often. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> now one thing we haven't talked about just yet is because I'm sure everyone's wondering, OK, Shane, you had us walk through the spectrum activity. We talked about all these indicators, but you haven't said anything about the middle class. I want to know what class label I am. Or for some of you, you're like, mm, don't label me just yet, because that's going to be alarming. So for the purposes of this activity, you know, naturally, we, in politics, people hear that you know, there's the squeezing of the middle class, and there are only but so many people in chronic poverty. And Beyonce and Jay-Z are relatively unlabeled, but some would argue that they're owning class, ruling class, or creating a plutocracy. But <clears throat> for the purposes of the exercise, I'm going to put general class labels into different corners so you can get a sense of who's in the room. Now, for some people, that might um, be revealing or illuminating. For others, it might seem a little bit of rigid and narrow. But for the purposes of the activity, I'm just going to ask you to just stick with it for the sake of discussion. So if anyone stood over in this corner, you would be described as lower middle class. So on the lower end of the spectrum, um, you wouldn't necessarily have a college degree, but you would have income from work. And if you lost a job, you would be very quickly moved into this area, which is known as working class or chronic poverty. So incredible instability and always striving to sort of just have enough. That makes sense? Over here, there are actually a couple of labels that could actually be applied to this um, section. So owning class is one definition of people who are educated at elite institutions, have multiple homes, they have significant resources and access to money such that anything they do is for their own entertainment. They don't actually have to work because of the amount of wealth that they've derived. Does that make sense? And then over here, would be loosely described as the middle middle class or upper middle class in the sense that the people in this category tend to come from families that are relatively well educated and occupy particular stations in their lives where if one person were to lose, one breadwinner were to lose an income, it wouldn't deeply impact them. But if two people were to no longer be working, they would definitely be in a very dire position. That makes sense? Okay, so what I'm gonna have you do now that you have some general class labels and if you want to know about what the percentages are for each class within the United States, I'll refer you to your packet. But what I want you all to do is to get into groups of about five or so people. And you're going to do a few things. You're going to get into a group of five. You're going to appoint one person as the scribe to write down the group thoughts. And <clears throat> you're going to do four things. One, you're going to talk about what are the strengths of growing up in your class background. What were some of the values that were instilled in you? What were some of the messages that you received? Second, you're going to talk a little bit about what were some of the limitations, because every class background has particular things that don't aid its own survival, for lack of a better reference. And then the third thing that you're going to talk about is, as you were, you were going through the Four Corners activity, I kept on asking you to take note of any patterns that you might have noticed, whether it's racial or ethnic or gender or immigration status or any of these other things. Think about that, because a lot of this conversation is also focused on the United States. So if your family comes from a foreign country, it can be very, very difficult to locate yourself within this spectrum. And then the fourth thing, which is also just as important, is coming up with a team name, because you know everybody's got to have a team, right? Okay, I guess my jokes just aren't good. So <laughs> I can live with that. So find your five, find your scribe, and I'll give you about 15 to 20 minutes to talk. And if you want a refresher on the, the prompts, I, that, those are in your packets. We, we didn't quite understand what sure. you meant when you asked about the patterns. Yes. 
Yeah, so if there are any patterns that you noticed while growing up thinking about your class background, if there were any racial or ethnic patterns, patterns of immigration status, like, you know, many of the people who were low income in my neighborhood also happened to immigrate to the United States from another place, or a lot of the people in my neighborhood were single female households, you know, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm going to bring everyone back together. So make sure to thank your group mates, class solidarity, yay. And feel free to return to your seats, but stay near your group. Okay. okay. Oh, so, so we have until what? Three fifteen, right? Three fifteen. Oh, perfect. Good. Okay. So we have about fifteen minutes left. You all have had an opportunity to go through a sorting experience. You had some conversation to be in community with people of a similar class background, and you've reflected on some strengths, limitations, patterns that you might have noticed, and you've come up with a team name. Now, we may not have time. Oh, it's all right if you didn't have a team name. It's OK. That is, there you go. So we may not have time to get to every group, but if a few groups wanted to share some of the things that they came up with, that would be pretty spectacular. Oh, I see a hand. Mm -hmm. What ends up happening is like we end up being like charitable. Mm -hmm. I guess one of our strengths or whatever, because when we do finally have money, when we have something to share with people, we love to share it. Like I love tipping people. I'll give somebody like a twenty dollars, and they're like, "The hell!" Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. Great. What were some other strengths that y'all came up with? Oh, um, other strengths. We um, we're able to sit. We're able to save better. We can serve a lot more because you know we can't just go out and buy the next, buy the next thing. We uh, mm -hmm. tend to longer, we appreciate it more when we have money. Yeah. You know? And so the strength and some of the weaknesses were like, um, uh, where's that guy? You got the paper right over there. Scribe and speaker. I thought I had to say like one thing. I'm going over the whole list. We'll take it. Limitations? Limitations? Mm -hmm. We had to deal with very limited resources. We didn't really have computers or uh, my family didn't have a car until later on. Mm -hmm. We have to deal with language limitations. How my mom speaks broken English, and mm -hmm. that's very hard to convey any sane knowledge to anyone who knows how to speak English mm. without without them saying, "What are you? What are you trying to tell me?" Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then she gets louder. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that doesn't help. We also have to deal with the media impact. Again, a lot of us didn't grow up with computers or phones mm -hmm. or anything. When the media actually did hit us, like it was big. When I first got my computer, I was like excited, and then I accidentally broke it because I was doing too much with it. Mm. But that's another story. Yeah. Another thing is instabilities. With our families, when growing up, we had very low income, so our family, our my parents would often get in fights with each other about what do, what do we really need, mm -hmm. what do we really need to get for our children and for us, and that's the limitation. Great, thank you. Would another team like to share? Oh, claps are welcome. I saw claps. <laughs> you welcome claps. <laughs> sure. Uh, we were all working together. Um, my team members were scattered, and we were 
the lower middle class group, and we named ourselves the Boomers plus One X. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, we thought that some of the benefits that derived from, from the backgrounds we came from were that we were hard working. We mm -hmm. believed in a, a really strong work ethic, um, and we had a pride in taking care of ourselves and what we had because our uh, what we had was limited, so we yeah. took care of it. Mm -hmm. um, we were very frugal. Um, we did a lot of repurposing and recycling before it was popular. Mm -hmm. And yeah. folks had side jobs, so someone went to his mom, sold Avon, and people worked a second little job, mm -hmm. etc. Um, we wore handy down clothing and appreciated um, the value of things and not necessarily what was new. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we, uh, we had very strong family ties because the family was a support system. And um, some of the negatives that came from it were that um, our financial difficulties limited our choices. And uh, others' perceptions of who we were mm -hmm. sometimes limited our choices as well. Or we weren't even offered information that would allow us other choices. Um, and our whole networking capacity was limited. Mm -hmm. We come from a higher class of people with connections. Mm -hmm. We yeah. have a great networking group. Mm -hmm. And that was about as far as we oh, Great. Thank you. That's okay. Thank you. Well, feel free to clap. Would another team like to share? Yeah. Hi. Um, our group represented the upper middle class corner. We forgot a name. I think no, I would. Banana Republic. Okay, we're Banana Republic. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Um, <coughs> um, we thought that one of our strengths was that um, the value of higher education and the value of work were both assumed. Mm -hmm. uh, some of us talked about how it was assumed that we were going to go to college. It was just a question of what that would look like. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about having, you know, being expected to have summer jobs as a way of. Um, earning our own stuff, not strictly because our parents couldn't pay for stuff for us, but because they felt like we should be part of that experience. Mm -hmm. um, we had, I think one thing that marked us was we had a couple of things that we listed under both strengths and weaknesses. We had kind of conflicted feelings about uh, the degree to which we were sheltered. Uh, we kind of, we appreciated the sense of safety and, and often not always the sense of stability, but also felt like that um, to some extent cut us off from uh, the experience of sometimes other classes. And we felt like that also about the fact that we had exposure to both higher and lower economic classes than we were. Mm -hmm. um, we, we sort of, it helped us to appreciate what we had in a balanced way, but sometimes it helped, it sort of made us feel a little more alienated from both groups, you know, mm -hmm. the sort of rich kids who kind of get everything handed to them and the, you know, as sometimes we perceive it and the poor kids who, you know, whatever whatever baggage we carry sometimes that's you know a, a sense of people aren't safe or they're not working hard enough or whatever it is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, sure. i was in building more oh. <laughs> oh, thank you. We, we felt that in the higher level ones um we felt the same about the work ethic you know that um our parents really instilled in us, even though we were privileged and had what we wanted, and we really didn't have to work for anything, although each of us had some jobs in some capacity during that age, you know, going from teenage years, you know, to young adulthood. Um, I, I think family is tremendously important, and respect for, our, you know, our elders' family members, too, mm -hmm. um, and a, a few of us have now lost the, that whole concept, you know, from the elder family members, so we don't have that in close circle as much anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, I, again, religion plays a very um, mm -hmm. close part. Great intersection. Lives, too. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it has very much of a factor. And... Um, I, I think that, you know, um, we have to realize that we, did, we were obviously privileged, but we need to do some for other people because of this and mm -hmm. have this, this ability mm -hmm. to do what we wanted to do. Oh, much. Thank you. So, um, thank you. <laughs> Would any other teams like to go? Yeah. I, wanted, I forgot to mention that one of our team members uh, listed as a... Um, a benefit mm -hmm. was ca 
kept with the living kind of under strain mm -hmm. and kind of from crisis to crisis did have the effect of building character. Mm -hmm. You know, stick with it or find another way or whatever, but it's built our character. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perseverance, resilience, also important characteristics. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. I just have one point. I sure. was in the poverty category. Yeah. And the group of students that I've been working with are wonderful kids. Um, they said it's interesting in patterns. Mm -hmm. People on either side of the room tended to stay on that side of the room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I thought that was rather interesting. Mm -hmm. It's a very, very pointy point. Some Huh? If they're Banana Republic, can you be Kmart? Oh, you can label yourself however you're most comfortable. <laughs> I, I think I saw another hand up around this area for a team that wanted to go. No? Yes? No? Yes. How about it? Uh, my team is stakes up because we're at one. Stay. Um, so I just wanted to get that out of the way. Uh, anyway, um, uh, some points that we kind of went through was kind of uh, one was a lack of sight of upward uh, op opportunities to move upward mm -hmm. in the social class. And I felt like that kind of links into kind of uh, reliance on stability mm -hmm. because we're so focused on being upper middle class and everything, trying to stay where we are, yeah. keep a good comfort bubble, which is one of the strengths of being upper middle class, being able to do all these sort of different things mm -hmm. without having you know, to worry about too much, like, am I going to be able to eat today, things like that. Am I going to have a roof over my head? But it kind of goes into, like, for example, like, at least my family was, back when I was much younger, my dad had an opportunity to kind of work for a big company, mm -hmm. and he didn't actually realize it at the time when he was approached, because he was very focused on trying to make sure that he did well at his job and everything, and just kept the money on the table, the bread on the table and everything. Mm -hmm. So, because of the fact that he was really just trying to focus on staying where he was and everything, he didn't recognize that opportunity, mm. but uh, it also kind of goes into we're very much trying to stay where we are in that sort of upper middle class space. Mm -hmm. So we aren't really super, we don't take a lot of big risks, mm -hmm. things like that. But it's also that uh, we don't really try and increase upward movement from different social cat like different classes. Mm -hmm. So, like, we aren't, like, giving money to the poor or anything like that. For most of us, it was just we're trying to make sure we have bread on the table and everything and trying to make sure we can stay where we are socially, economically, and things like that. Mm -hmm. Great maintenance. There's, oh, claps. We also have some claps. <laughs> That's an important point that you make around sort of people or some people are trying to stay right where they are for fear of what it might mean to move further up or not give too much away for the oppression of what does it mean to have the disposable income to either pity people or be charitable. I once did this workshop with a person, um, I'm on a board for a nonprofit, and I did it with my fellow board members. And there was one person who was literally all the way up in the corner of like owning class. And when she had to like reflect on that, it was very, very upsetting for her because she was thinking I can't go any higher because I'll only become more and more alienated from most of most everyone that I encounter. Um, <clears throat> so thinking about how no matter what end of the spectrum you are is a significantly isolating or alienating, but there's a difference between sort of um, issues of livelihood versus um, <clears throat> levels and degrees of comfort. Mm -hmm. So now that we've sort of closed that out, any thoughts, reflections, anything surprising that anyone heard that they want to talk about or share with the group? Because we have about four more minutes, but I do want to talk about this and then also close out with a video. Yes. Well, I just want to refer back to that notion that I brought up earlier, the notion of genera uh, generational, mm -hmm. where I maintain myself over there. Yeah. My children might yeah. be over here. Yes. Mm -hmm. and my grandchildren on the bus. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On the bus. Mm -hmm. So uh, I thought that was interesting. Mm -hmm. No, that's a, a great, that's a great point that you make because, you know, unless you're Dr. Dre, where you're going to be a billionaire, in your whole lifetime, oftentimes the upward, like accruing wealth actually requires generations. So one thing that we won't necessarily have time to talk about is, you know, the U.S. racial wealth divide. And one, one of the reasons I really like facilitating dialogues around class identity, this is my super top secret that I'm going to reveal to all of you. So if this video is going on YouTube, uh, there goes the secret. But, but I really, I find that if people don't believe that racism is real or exists, if you talk 
about it, if you talk about the US racial wealth divide through the lens of class, it becomes very, very clear that racism is real and structural in the sense that one of the statistics we talk about is for every dollar of average wealth that a white family has, the average family of color only has 10 cents. Because when it comes to the accrual of wealth, property, land, and resources, it takes generations to accrue that. So what does it mean if people have different stopping and starting points based on historical inequities and how those inequities carry over throughout history? I think that resonates with someone. I see some smiling. Mm -hmm. I'll take smiles. Um, <clears throat> so I think that's really important to note around that how the generations, it can take generations to get up to a particularly comfortable place, or it could, or poverty can be carried through generations based on laws and restrictions that people face. Cultivation, and I can't think of the author. Oh, me neither. I'm going to hold on to that, and we're going to find them later. Other, I think you had a reflection over here. Oh, I was going to say about um, our Banana Republic upper middle class group. A couple, several of us also said that um, 12 was an interesting age because if you had pegged us at six, we mm. would have been in lower middle class. Mm. So even even within a know, lifetime, the sort of single generation, mm -hmm. there's some there's some movement that yes. we experienced or at least we watched happen. Mm -hmm. Yes, I've only had one experience where we facilitated. Uh, four Corners activity with people at the age of 12, but then said, okay, now we're going to do this experience right right now as you are an adult, and it was devastating, so I've never done it again. Um, <laughs> so, just, so if you'd like to take that risk, I can send you the instructions, and you can uh, party fun. Um, so does this actually have sound, this computer? Oh, great. So I'm actually going to ask you all to close your eyes, and I'm going to have you think of soothing thoughts. Do close your eyes. And if your soothing thoughts include not hearing my voice, um, walking hand in hand with a loved one, you have your thoughts. Hold on to them. So I'm going to ask you to close your eyes tightly. And then you know, just think of some of the conversations we've covered so far. No peeking. Uh, not sure if I hear it. <laughs> Oops. Oh. Oh, oh, should I use the mic? It's the speaker here, yes. Okay. Oh, that sounds like process. So, you know, we talked a little bit about assets. So assets are what you own. Art, land, jewelry, houses, vehicles, stocks, bonds, bank accounts, retirement accounts. And then, you know, debts. So assets minus debts equals wealth. And then debts, everything that you owe. So mortgage, car loans, unpaid bills, student loans, credit card balance. Um, <clears throat> now, oh, I'll just... Walk you through it. So they're about Is on, on, the... on this one. Yeah. yeah, both of them are on. It's not muted. Oh, no. Oh, is it on mute? No. Nope. Everything's. This one's on mute. Nope. Oh, well, well, there are about 120 million households in the United States with about $56 trillion of wealth. Now, the sound you're supposed to hear is one BB gun pellet. Oh, great, it sounds perfect. So that one BB gun pellet represents $5,000. So now, if wealth were equally divided, that's sound like. That's the sound of 100 BB gun pellets. So $500,000 per household. So that's the bottom 50%, so $10,000 average.
<laughs> and the end. Thank you, everyone. So for any of the scribes, if you want to give me your notes, what I'll do is type up the notes that I get and send it all back out to the group, in addition to some other resources that you might want to think about. Mm -hmm. So thanks, everyone.